very hard to, tr to keep the kind of historical accuracy of the origin in question, but in the end, he's very wedded to this story that he tells because of one really important thing that it gives him, a unifying principle. It gives him the way to understand <coughs> otherwise heterogeneous phenomena that he discovers in analysis and that he discovers um, in, in you know, his, his more theoretical writings. It gives him a way to bring all of these disparate phenomena that he has observed over the course of his entire career into, into clarity. Primarily, this Oedipal narrative, and I'm sure at least you all sort of know what's going on with the Oedipal conflict, right? You've heard about this before, you're in love with your mom, you want to kill your father, right? These things just are fundamental structures of the family, necessarily so. And he can't sort of bring them all together until he finds this origin story. And it's based in Darwin's primal horde, um, primitive horde rather, but it gives him everything he's looking for. Now, in the story, as I said, well, I'll get to the, I'll get to the, um, the actual story in just a minute, but it gives him the origins of conscience, it gives him the origins of religion, and the origins of society. It's just this one fantastic narrative. And this is why, even at the very end, the very end of his writing career, he's still bringing it up. He still brings up this great story one day, and he even talks about it in, the ter in terms of one day, like once upon a time. These brothers, so right, so the story is, it's sort of based on Darwin's primitive horde, which is based loosely on, you know, understanding how gorillas form societies where you have a patriarchal male with a harem of women, and when, or females, and when the adolescent, when, when <coughs> the male children grow into adolescence and can actually challenge their father for supremacy of the group, they get ejected before they become too powerful, before they can actually challenge their father. But in this story, these brothers come together, right? they find each other, and they say, let's overthrow dad and take his position. And this is what they do. Now, what's amazing, of course, is, I mean, obviously it goes without saying that they're going to eat him, too. <laughs> yeah, this goes without saying, okay. So, of course, they're going to eat him, too. But so they come together, and they, they murder and consume him. And this gets, this gets preserved in all kinds of totemic feasts that break things to sort of show this original event. And, and you know, even like the, um, the sharing of, of, the, of the body and blood of Jesus Christ would be a totem meal. <laughs> We're all sort of meeting the Father and sharing in his power by doing this kind of thing. And so he sort of traces this all back to this event that must have happened. Or maybe it didn't, but it doesn't matter if it didn't, because it has this powerful sway over every way that we can understand our modern situation. So um, when they do this, so for Freud, there's this, this, this primary ambivalence that we have towards particularly our fathers. This is what he's most interested in. We love him. Hate him. We also love and hate our moms, but that's not so important right now because we're talking about the masculine, right? But we love him and we hate him. We want to be the object of his desire, but we also want to take his place and be the object of, of our mother's desire. So when these, and this is just how it is, people, there's no getting out of this. It's not like you can be like, I'm so above that right now. No, you're not. For Freud, <laughs> all of you have lived this. You've all done this. You're all still doing it. And should you have children, they're going to do it to you. Sorry. Once the, the brothers have killed the father and eaten him and taken his power by doing so, well, they sort of satisfied their hatred of him. Okay, we got rid of that. And then they're just left with this love. It's a tragic, actually. It's a sort of tragic beginning of human society for Freud. And that love of them now no longer be fulfilled because they killed a dad. And so it sort of becomes the primary beginnings of guilt, because that love now no longer has the object, and, and so these things get turned inward. Um, and also uh, pr produces the very, uh, the very first kinds of um, social rules. You, because they so they now have this beginning of guilt, they all decide that they're not going to have sex with the women of the group, right? Which makes perfect sense, right? 
from how they got them. They're like, oh no, we'll have the incest taboo. Let's be sure that we don't sleep with anybody that we shouldn't sleep with. <coughs> and um, they also have the prohibition against murder. So this begins civilization for <coughs> modern civilization. And it has to be, it has to be absolute. So for Freud, I mean, you might sort of say, look, I know Freud. And for Freud, the fantasy is enough. It doesn't have to have actually happened. And that's partially true. But he just can't resolve whether or not it was just pure fantasy, whether or not it actually happened. But in the end, it doesn't matter. Because the event, fantasized or real, happened. That sounds strange. But it happened insofar as everyone has it. And so you can find it in yourself, right? The remnants of this, the desire to kill and, and take over your father's position. And perhaps he believes you can see this in so many totemic feasts throughout so many different cultures and throughout such a long historical time period that it must necessarily have been the case. So whether, and this is a lovely line, and he says this um, in, in, in a couple of different places. Whether one has killed one's father or is abstained from doing so is not really the decisive thing. One found to be guilty in either case of the sense of guilt is an expression of the conflict due to their vigilance, the vigilance of love and hatred, Eros and Thanatos. This conflict is set going as soon as men are faced with the task of living together. As soon as society, civilization, and in any kind, in any kind of vaguely modern sense, comes into existence. <coughs> so long as the community assumes no other form than that of the family, and for Freud, you can't really conceive of a society that is not formed by families. The conflict is bound to express itself as ethics conflicts to establish the conscience and to create the first sense of guilt. So it's pretty, it's pretty uh, binding. There's no real easy way to get out of this particular situation. All right. So what can we conclude from Freud? This wonderful story of the primal murder and consumption of the father happened in fact, in history, or it didn't. Doesn't matter in the end, although it probably does matter in the end. I mean, I'm going to go on record saying it probably <laughs> does matter, but for Freud, it doesn't matter in the end. All that matters is that it operates transculturally. <coughs> it is simply fundamental to understanding the modern human condition in whatever form it's going to take. Um, and we get religion, we get morals, we get society, because we get art out of this. I mean, we get everything. Why? Because this story binds under the umbrella of unity all these disparate heterogeneous phenomena. Right? This is a lot of different kinds of things to cover. Wouldn't it be nice if we had one explanation that made sense of all of it? So for him, oh, the relief it must have been to find the one explanation. But again, like Nietzsche, beginning is talking to the enemy of violence, and death is paid to the masculine. The only appearance of women in this story is like, you know, they're sort of the property of the, of the big bad patriarch, and then they are uh, <coughs> limits to the band of brothers who form the society. But they're not sort of actively participating in this conversation, like how can we form society together? No. They are merely the property distributed between either the patriarch or the brothers after the Okay, so just to tie these two together before we move into the war, you can see that for Nietzsche, um, there is no the origin of patriarchy, which is what we're going to start talking about, not to tie the determinant beginning because nothing actually took place. It is a fiction, and you can entertain other fictions if they happen to be more persuasive. He welcomes you to do so. <laughs> to find other ways of interpreting this. If it's not as good as his, we'll stick with his, but if it's better than his, fine. The theory requires that you bring other origin stories into it. And then this is just another another quote from the Twilight of the Idols where he, he really wants to draw our attention to this tendency that we have to make one explanatory principle, the system of all principles. And 
that that's dangerous because that locks us into something that can't possibly be true because we don't have access to these origins and we don't have access to the truth and we're necessarily finite <coughs> and limited by our perspective. So any claim to be otherwise is going to lead us down a very dangerous path. Whereas for Freud, right, the origin of the ethical patriarchy can be tied to this event as well fantasized. It's real insofar as we can find it everywhere we look. So it has to be operating in religion, social, uh, society, morality, art. And it seems, and I'm going to argue, although we don't, I don't have to argue that now, but even at the very end, we just, uh, the constructions and analysis is a very late piece, and he's still talking about the historical truth of this event. I think he really wants it to be true, even though he recognizes he can't go out on a limb and make the claim that's historically true. Okay. Yes! <laughs> I'm so excited about this slide. Now let's talk about the ladies. Because where are they? There's just nothing about the women in these stories at all. And this is why the war is so fascinating. Because on the one hand, <coughs> she's going to adopt this, this masculine model. And it's going to be so obvious that she's just sort of like, yes, consciousness is by nature violent. And just like men fight, so women will probably fight it too. But on the other hand, she's going to say that doesn't really seem to explain why women have been oppressed. Because she believes that she has a very ambivalent relationship to this question. But look, in the, in the beginning, once upon a time, in human prehistory, women were probably just as strong as men, physically, and they were probably just as warlike as men. But there, there must have been something that prevented them from being a part of these of the of this origin that led to their historical oppression. So, regardless of the differences in the fixity of the origins of society, differences which admittedly are profound, both Freud and Nietzsche posit violence and murder as beginnings of civilization that either forget the place of women entirely, as we find in Nietzsche, or simply reduce them to the property of the jealous father or murderous children, as we find in Freud. And no point does either author question the necessity of thinking through origins without violence an obvious masculine privilege. Whatever happened, or whatever we wish to have happened in our entrance into human being, happen between men. So, this is my question. <coughs> in what Bofar does with that annoying section on the nomads, the section that just, just gets in the crawl and I don't really know what to do with it because it's so fantastic and so bizarre. I mean, she says contradictory things, one right after the other in this section. Women were, were obviously physically equal to men. Women obviously weren't physically equal to men. Whatever's going on in the section, I want to see if she's talking about origins in a kind of free-floating, non-binding, indeterminate way that Nietzsche does, or is she talking about it more in this, there has to be a real fantasized or actual event in, in the way that Freud talks about it. Okay, so here I tell a couple of quotes where she says more. I mean, really, she kind of goes and, and tries to say <coughs> things. On one hand, this world has always belonged to males, None of the reasons given for this have ever seemed sufficient. By reviewing prehistoric and epigraphic data and the life of existential philosophy, we can understand how the hierarchy of the sexes came to be. And we can understand this because we're going to find the moment when this happened. Right? And, and there's a certain way that she talks about it. It gets good, it gets even crazier. That sounds like there's this thing that kind of happened. On the other hand, it didn't happen. The problem is, there's no event. And if there's no event, how can you con conceive of any other way? So it, alternative here appears, and that's otherness, the way in which women get conceived as being the other to men. Alternity here appears to be an absolute part two that falls outside of the accidental nature of historical fact. A situation created over time can come undone at another time. In the introduction of the second section, talks about the fact that this is the real problem here. Right, so with the Jewish diaspora, with American slavery, with colonization, there are, there are times at which oppressed people can say, you know, it wasn't always like this. There was a time before <coughs> X event or events happened that things were other than they are now. Therefore, we can imagine a time when they're no longer like they are now. So this is Beauvoir's argument. The 
problem with women's subordination is that there's no real, or there was never like the, the, the capture of the Amazons and the enslavement of them to male desire. That never happened. It just sort of seems to be for a war, it's just always sort of like this. Yes, there are historical oddities where women have been treated equally, for the most part, for the war. It's always like this. So there wasn't an event, and that's the problem. <laughs> you, honestly, these pictures are, I realize, because I like the part that looks really stupid. You have no idea how hard it was to find non-racist pictures. I just wanted to be able to say, like, look, here's a picture of, like, you know, a nomadic human being, you know, showing what Bill Hart means by these things, and it was just impossible to do, so I thought maybe clip art would be somehow easier in that way. Probably doesn't mean that. But, for war leaves in the ambiguity of the human experience, so that all of us are these ambiguous, collaborations of mind and body, of, of spirit and nature, and that the problem is when we try to divide, make a strict divide between our fundamental ambiguity that we are embodied consciousnesses and can only make a distinction between those analytically, and, and, we, and we sort of say, look, one of us is going to uh, enact one aspect of the human condition, and the other of us is going to enact the other aspect of the human condition. Because what she thinks happens, she, you know, she talks about this, and she even had existentialism, she talks about this in terms of transcendence and imminence. Or if you read your Star Trek, right, there's the plasticity and transcendence, being in itself and being for itself. And the problem, and this is a gross oversimplification, but whatever, so we'll talk about it more if you want to. The problem is that women have been associated with the kinds of imminent, aspects of human being. Now, imminence doesn't just mean nature, although it often is associated with that, right? Women are more natural, mother nature, they're more in tune with their bodies, and men are more free and transcendent, but the problem, but, but it does often divide along those natural lines. And so, in a certain sense, Beauvoir will say, and whatever nature is, yes, that's obviously very problematic, that whereas there are certain components of human being that require maintenance, right? You have to eat all the time, you have to digest, you have to defecate, you have to sleep, and there's sex, which kind of is on the borderline here. But there are these certain things that have to be constantly maintained, and they're relatively repetitive, right? You sleep, you wake up, you sleep, you wake up, you sleep, you wake up. There's not like a whole lot of creativity in that process. You breathe, you eat, you drink. These things kind of require constant maintenance, constant upkeep. That's required in order to express that's required in order to transcend just sort of the base, cyclical, repetitive aspects of, of our imminent condition. But we're always full. We're always full. That for her, the early Star Trek, if you've read any of that stuff, is just way too cog, it's way too conceptual, or it's way too consciousness heaven, like I just transcend freely my situation. And she says, no, you have to always take the situation, which would be Right? You're the living, um, growing, um, I don't need the word natural, but cyclical element of what it means to be human up in all of your projects. So freedom always has to take this with it. The problem is then women got shunted to the side, and because, and because of a very important reason, we're forced to sort of take care of all of these elements of life so that in society men could transcend. <coughs> so she says men aren't necessarily more strong than women, they're not necessarily um, more warlike than women, so what, what disadvantage could have possibly befallen women in our human prehistory? Babies. Babies happen to women. <laughs> oh, we were under the tyranny of our reproductive bodies. But before, this is the answer. She has this narrative. It's, it's just, it's amazing. You'll all read this now. When you read it, it's like they're just as strong. Oh, but she calls it absurd fertility. She has this idea that women were just constantly pregnant or menstruating or 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 suckling from just the very, very beginning. Right? As soon as a woman could become fertile, that was it. Her life was marked by this in early um, human prehistory, and that this was the great disadvantage. Because of their maternal, because of their reproductive bodies, 
they were burdened by this, you know, the absurd fertility of, as what she calls it, of the female body. And this, she says, was the, the greatest curse, yes, the worst curse that was laid on them. Because they could not then participate in these early, violent, <coughs> creative, transcending activities that men were able to participate in. They had to, in order to procure protection for themselves in their most vulnerable physical states, basically give freedom over to the men so that they could raise these children. And she, the way she talks about the children too, it's like in nomadic societies, they're like burdened, they don't really want them. You know, there's a lot there's like rampant infanticide because they don't really care about them. It's just like, oh, and the mouth could be. So she has this really wild narrative about what a curse this was. I mean, this is also very Canadian. The warrior risks his own life to raise the prestige of the horde. The hunter is not a butcher. He runs risks in the struggle against wild animals. Why? Because they get to face their death head on. I see that I could die, and even though I could, this animal could kill me, or this other competing man could kill me, I still choose to put my life on the line. And therefore, I recognize that there is something more important than life. There is freedom. Right? So, right? Like, so romantic. Women, because they could not do this because they're just like, you know, Babies all everywhere, <laughs> menstruating constantly, could not do this. So they never got to experience freedom. They never got to look death in the face and say, I still choose to move forward even though it could be the end of my life because there are things that are more important than life than just simply living. Whoa, right? What am I doing here? Okay, I've got two more minutes. Wrap this puppy up. So this is based very much in the Able's Master Slave dialectic, which I'm not going to give you the whole rundown. But it's essentially this. For Hegel, who will bar the very precedent, the movement into self consciousness, which would be what we think of as being moved out of consciousness, involves fight that somebody Dialectic. Two consciousnesses face each other and they vie for absolute sovereignty. And one of them says, I give up. I'd rather be a slave. You can control me because I would I see that life is necessary for freedom. So why would this be important? Right? So for Hegel, this is really important in the advancement of human consciousness. We all have to sort of go through this either really or psychically. You have to see the threat of, of actual violent death or psychic violent death. You have to see this in order to then say, no, I, I see that there is something more valuable than just mere life. If women never got to participate in battle, in <coughs> they never got to have this confrontation. And this is for Beauvoir, I think, origin of why women are caught in this kind of patriarchal society. That the fundamental structures of consciousness require, like you see this in Freud and Nietzsche too, require this confrontation so that you see that freedom is more important than mere life. But without that, you simply allow yourself to just be the main, the main, the maintainer of mere life. You allow yourself, without even realizing that there was even a battle to enter into at all, that this is simply the natural course of things. This is just the way women are. This is just the way men are. So, this is why she says at the end of this passage, <coughs> the master's privilege, this is her discussion tale, right? The master's privilege arises from the affirmation of spirit over life. Yes. Freedom over simply living. I'm willing to stake my life for that. But in fact, the gay for slaves experience the same risk. The slave, who ends up being the winner in Hegel's story eventually, but they were a long time, um, re realizes, oh yes, also the same thing. I risked my life. I just said, okay, fine, I give in. I give in. Fine. You can, you can be the master. But they both had the confrontation. But the woman is originally an existent who gives life does not risk her life. There's never been a combat. Therefore, the definition that Hegel gives of master and slave, which you find in Nietzsche and in Freud, <coughs> ways, but particularly along the ways of violent confrontation, violent
violent domination applied particularly well to her. So she lost the battle, in other words, because there was no battle. And this is the problem. So this is her origin. On the one hand, she says, I agree. There's no actual event that, there's no actual event where this took place. So on this side, she really agrees with Nietzsche. There was no moment in time where the band of sisters came together and decided to allow themselves to be in some, that didn't ever happen. It just never actually occurred. So that's a good thing, because if that's the case, then like Nietzsche, who can conceive of all kinds of different sorts of future possibilities because we're not tied to a necessary origin, well, Laura says, look, there's all kinds of different ways we can conceive of forming human society. Because there's no event we gotta get over. Like, this is how it started, so we have to keep going back to it and go back to it and go back to it, like Freud has. But, <coughs> Freud, she has a structure of consciousness that she cannot disabuse herself of. It just functions as necessarily operative in the way that she conceives of, the relation, of human interrelationships. Look, you have to understand that we're always buying for for <coughs> and the best we're going to do is recognize that and and get over it make a society based on friendship and generosity but you have to begin by understanding that alterity otherness and confrontation is at the heart of all human interactions and it's going to be it's why men one well they want to be because of the absurd fertility of this crazy female body but it's why men would have wanted to win over women. It's not like, oh, you know, men were so mean. No, women could have done it, they would have done it too. Because this is something that is sexless for the war. So there's both an origin and there's not an origin in the absolute sense in her analysis. So I think this is how she she tries to ride the border between both Anisha and Freud. The past, and what was the good thing about this, I think there's a lot we can critique about it, the good thing is that the past does still exert an influence, but we would be foolish to not think that it does. You have to take it into consideration. Even if you're fabricating it fictionally, you still have to take this into consideration. On the other hand, since that origin is not absolute in the historical sense, we can imagine different kinds of futures. And this, I'll just sort of um, close with this, this, this quote, which is what I think that she hopes that we can, we can advance too. In these combats where they believe they're attacking each other, men and women, and it's just like enough, enough of this. Let's get past this now. Let's move away from this. They're fighting themselves, projecting onto their partner the part of themselves they repudiate. So I don't like the whole idea that there's this imminence that I have to eat, that I have to sleep, that I have to take care of this body thing. So I'm going to repudiate that and put it on you. <laughs> human is to be embodied. Instead of living the ambiguity of their condition, that we are transcendence and imminence. Always. Each one tries to make the other accept the objection of this condition and reserves the honor of it for oneself. If, however, both assumed it with lucid modesty, as the plural is authentic pride, they would recognize each other as peers and live the erotic drama in harmony. So, just you know, just to sort of wrap it up here, um, I'll read the, the very end of the paper and then let's just open it up to some conversation. So if the Borean knot of patriarchal culture is loosened by the acceptance of our ambiguity, and I mean, if we can do this right now, if we say <coughs> we are ambiguous and we don't need to divide humanity up in these artificial ways, if we do that, then we can envision a different future, but also perhaps we should adopt the same approach to its origin, the origin of the patriarchy. This would help make more palatable not only the bizarre claims about women's reproductive handicaps, she used the word handicap, I didn't say that, yeah, she used the word handicap, um, but the uncomfortable adoption of psychic and physical violence that marks human or male transcendence. We can imagine with this idea of the free floating origins of Nietzsche's genealogical analysis, which opens us up to future possibilities untethered to our mythic past, as well as the determining structures of Freud's narrative, which provides us with precious tools to evaluate.
evaluate practices and thought and action so long standing <coughs> essential structures of consciousness and culture. Right? At a certain point, if stuff has been hanging around that long, maybe we should start to look at it in a kind of maybe this is the more essential than we want to give it credit for. All allow refusing to swear allegiance to either. It doesn't have to be one side or the other. In this way, we can occupy the space of ambiguity so difficult to maintain, but so vital for ethical existence and critical reflection. Thank you, Carla. All right, so anything, I don't care. You can ask whatever you want. If you haven't read these people before, I'm happy to take any kind of question in any way. No, I can feel them. I'm still with mine. Yes? Um, so I'm curious about what's going on with Floyd when this event happened or in part, right? Yes. Um, and I'm trying to think about the <coughs> difference with Nietzsche, right? The kind yeah. that you brought up. And in, so with Nietzsche, sort of... I'm looking for a pen. Uh, yes. so, so with Nietzsche, it doesn't really matter if we've got the right story. Yes. As long as we've got a plausible explanation. Yes. But so, presumably then there's got to be some criteria of some kind we use to determine the plausible yes. from the implausible. And so I wonder if there's a similarity there with Freud, right? Is that for Freud, the story is important because it accounts for certain psychological features we all have, like the, the commitment to family, but at the same time the tensions about family members, yeah. that this is sort of guilt, all this sort of stuff. So is there, I mean, I wonder about similarity there in the sense that what they really are both committed to is that there's this psychological feature of us. And origin stories <coughs> illustrate that, whether or not they happen or not, but they illustrate or indicate the what we're looking for yes. in the origin story. Oh, no, that's, that's, a, that's a marvelous question, and that, that goes right to the heart of it. I think that there is a similarity there, but here's the difference. I So, right, so for both, both Freud and Nietzsche are trying to diagnose the sickness of the contemporary. <coughs> and I do much, with Freud, I do sort of like the theoretical, you're, you're the, the meta-narrative, that I do believe that but they're both trying to say, why is the age so sick? Why, why are we suffering under the bad conscience, the guilty conscience? What is the sickness? So in that sense, right, they're sort of saying there's the shared structure of humanity. What's the best way to explain how it came to be? So there is something in common there. The difference is for Nietzsche, he fully admits that it was a consensus. And I may be wrong about other ways that, that, it, that it was formulated, but I'm pretty sure that there were other ways that human beings could have lived or did live and certainly can live. Whereas for he's locked in to this type of narrative. There is no other way that human being that we can understand human beings except through this. Every so you know, with the Women of the Party, this is this is their same criticism of them. Like, yeah, why are you so wedded to this ultimate origin? Because it it precludes any other way of seeing. I mean, he says, right, so when we get to future evolution, he says, look, the best that we can do, maybe we can get out or maybe we can't, but really the best thing that we can do is just learn to live with, the, with the, the weight of civilization. That's the best thing we can do to make it livable, to accept the kind of pain of what it means to live in modern civilization. But he doesn't really say we can radically change society and be Wonder Woman or anything like that. He says, if we're going to have civilization at all, it's going to require this ethical narrative. And so I think that's the difference. There's just really no other way to understand it. Whereas for Nietzsche, my story is really good, but I know that there are other ways of telling this story because there are other ways of being human. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you. Yes. So for Beauvoir, um, women don't understand the, the value of fighting for their life because they've never been a part of the battle. Is that That's exactly right. right. But haven't they kind of always been a part of the battle because they've been suppressed, but they just didn't realize they were? So where is where is the origin of unrest for her that brings about like feminism and yeah. the new thought? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that's such a oh, that's a great question. So great question. they <laughs> I mean, I have, I have argued elsewhere that part of the problem is that we're frozen in this particular stage. So there's sort of, for Hegel, there's, even though it takes a long time, like when you have relationships of mastery and servitude, and Marx does this when he talks about the different ways in which
which society formulates and has to go through various revolutions and new kinds of societies, that there is the kind of free willingness to enter into this kind of struggle for power. And although women didn't do that, they still got cast in that role. So that's why it's been so long standing. Right? So they, they just sort of have frozen in this moment of, of struggle. But since they've been, even though they didn't sort of willingly enter into it, but since they have, in fact, entered into that, that they've been sort of cast in that role, it allows them to come to an understanding that they have been cast in that role. And that's what Gobar's call to arms is. Look, you may never have really entered into this fight, but you're in this fight. So it's best for you to come out of it now and to fight to take your place. You know, she's got a very sort of masculine idea of human subjectivity. So now we can all be just like men. And you need to sort of raise yourself up to be just like them. But it's because you can learn the lesson and kind of wake up to it because you were put in it even though you didn't choose. So it's a great question. And, and I mean, how she's able to work that out, I mean, I, that, that goes into really sort of deep analysis of Hegel's master slave dialectic. But that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, the surface version of it. You, know, you can still see it if you can open your eyes to it and you can recognize it through this historical analysis. It's a great question. Other questions? Yeah? So you said in your introduction, <laughs> what do you make of this? We're all supposed to just be like men. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> that's a feminist because I think that she started um, the, the kind of contemporary feminism that is, for me, the most interesting way of asking the questions about oppression and about femininity and masculinity and gender identification, all those kinds of things. That being said, it's deeply problematic to adopt the, con the conception of consciousness that she does. I focused on the violence. Now, that's bad enough. It's bad enough to sort of think that right now, Erin and I, in some way, are vying for, for authority, for domination, just by the fact that we are engaged in this conversation. It's like, oh yeah? I'm smarter than you, are you smarter than you? Really, should we take this outside? That's, I mean, it's not much more on a psychic level, but there's still this conception in the world that all human interactions are like this. Now, I kind of like that because I think it's cool. On the other hand, right, it helps explain a lot of uh, On the other hand, really? Is this really the best way to understand interpersonal relationships and the mediation of the self through the other? When I mediate myself and try to get recognized through Aaron, it doesn't have to be a fight for domination. It doesn't really have to be that way. So that already is very problematic. Now, Aaron's bringing up this other very problematic aspect of Beauvoir, which is consciousness is <coughs> largely not sexed. Your situation is a very sexed situation, right? You were raised to be men and women, boys and girls, and you went through the kind of training that taught you how to be this way, and you went through all the performances to get you into this position. But when she talks, so she's very good at understanding that. But when she talks about consciousness, when she talks about the mind, freedom, transcendence, it's all on this level of the human, right? Look, we're all human beings, and so we can all operate on this level, but when I showed you that slide of the bifurcation of the human, it was all the stuff that is masculine. And so that's problematic. Insofar, now, I don't think it's totally problematic. I'm unfortunately like kind of an enlightenment thinker, and so I still don't want to, I'm not really ready, just not totally ready to get rid of the ideals of the enlightenment and the sort of like, hey, there's something shared in all humanity, no matter how messed up we need to avoid that shared aspect. Still, it's not kind of cool. I haven't yet got rid of that, but I see the problems with it. And Beauvoir is an illustration of it. She's able to use it to diagnose patriarchy. She's able to use it to show oppressive structures in society 
but she's also not really cognizant of the way that she doesn't fully understand that perhaps consciousness and self-consciousness itself is an oppressive structure, the way that we have conceived it in history. Because it's what men have possessed and what they have used to deny women and other oppressed groups their what she considers to be basic human rights. So yeah, it's a I think she's great, but that doesn't, you know, anybody who's brave is never going to be beyond reproach or criticism. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of developing this thought, and I think this is just because I'm such a pragmatic thinker, but I, I like the idea in my mind, I don't know what you think about this, of taking Beauvoir's origin story um, and using it for good. So it seems to me that it's historically taken the fact that, at least in Western culture at this moment, we expanded rights to people because they have served in the military or they have put their lives on the line. Yeah. So you see that in sort of democracy in ancient Greece, we go way back, and then you see that like in our own US history, civil rights movement, you know, kind of related to <coughs> World War II. And now you have this big question, or you did have this question of sort of heterosexuality in the military, and then now you have women who are allowed to be in combat, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm always curious. Because there seems to be some kind of respect that happens, not easily, not without a lot of struggle and you know effort, but somehow that's such a, an important moment in our own story, you know, collectively. That I wonder if we can go ahead and use part of this, just just you know, pragmatically, not buy into it in the sort of Freudian description of consciousness, but you know, there might be something to it. So, in other words, that there might be value to the idea that there is a connection between. It's a useful Yeah. I mean, if, for example, <coughs> take it out of the, the critical component that I was talking about it with, look, there is something really interesting about this idea that we don't, that we are the only, I mean, for them, maybe we are, maybe dolphins and elephants actually have a conception of their own deaths. And at this point, it's still a little bit hard for us to access. So, so at least for humans, one of the most important our experience, if not the most important thing that marks our experience, is the fact that we know we're going to die, and we know that there are certain things that we could do that could hasten that end, right? <laughs> and we tend to avoid those situations. So when people put themselves in situations deliberately knowing that they could die, when most of us, like I say, spend our lives avoiding those very things, what does that say about those people? Right? What does it say about the human condition? And so I think that there is a certain probably well-deserved respect accorded to people who you know, come down out of helicopters to rescue fallen hikers at the bottom of, of gulches and who go into forests that are burning and just sort of put them out with, with, with water, or who you know, defend their land from attackers. I mean, there is something to be said about that experience because it magnifies what it means to be human in the, in the way that to be human is to be mortal, is to be finite, is to be vulnerable, is to be fragile, <coughs> and to be aware of that, right? To know that you are. And so I think that we, we don't need to throw the lesson out with this. I think that the lesson is sound, that confrontation with mortality is something that human beings do. Whether or not other extension things do it, I don't know. Well, we know that human beings do. So, it does seem to be something important, even if it's not the most important element of consciousness, it seems to be an important element of consciousness, and therefore, I think there's something to be said about individuals and groups of people who choose to put themselves in those situations. Yeah, absolutely.